Taylor and Maclaurin series. In this section, we will develop a technique that allows us to find power series representations of many different kinds of functions. So the basic question is, what functions have power series representations? And how can we find them? So let's start with our general power series representation. Our general power series is some function. Let's suppose it exists. Then I can represent it as c sub 0 plus c1 by x minus a plus c2 by x minus a square plus c3 by x minus a cubed, etc. Now, what we would, might want to find is now what are the coefficients? What are these c0, c1, c2, etc.? So, what I'm going to do is now, I'm going to let x equal a. So now notice, if I let x equal a, this implies then that f of a, well, if I let x equal a, notice how all of the terms drop out. All of the terms become zero except for one term. In this case, the first term, which is just c0. So then f of a is c0. All right, now, let's apply a derivative. Differentiating the left-hand side, I'd have f prime of x. On the right-hand side, that c0 drops off, and the derivative of x minus a is 1, so I'd end up with a c1. The derivative of x minus a squared is 2 times x minus a, so I'd then have 2 c2 by x minus a to the first. Similarly, my next term would be 3 c3 by x minus a squared. The next term, similarly, would be 4 c4 by x minus a cubed, and so on and so forth. Now again, I will let x equal a. And letting x equal a, notice again, all of the terms drop out except for the first term. And so then f prime of a would be equal to c1. And now let's differentiate again. Then f double prime of x would be 2c2 two two plus 3 times 2 times x minus a plus 4 times 3 times x minus a square. The next term would be 5 times 4 times x minus a cubed, and so on. Again, we'll let x equal a. And so then this would imply that f double prime of a would be 2c2. Two, two. We see a pattern forming here. Oh, let's continue. Let's, let's, let's go one more. The third derivative at x. The first term would drop out. I'd have a 3 times 2 plus... Uh, I'm, I, I, lost, I lost my c's here in the previous line. I'm sorry about that. I'd have a 3 times 2c3 of 4 times 3, c4, of 5 times 4, c5. Sorry about that. So, I'd have 3 times 2 times c3 plus 4 times 3 times 2 times c4 by x minus a, plus 5 times 4 times 3 times c5 by x minus a squared. Let me list one more term. Uh, my next term would be 6 by 5 by 4 by c6 by x minus a cubed, etc. Again, letting x equal a. This would then imply that the third derivative of f at a is 3 times 2 times c3. Do we see a pattern forming? Let's take it one more step.
the fourth derivative knocks out the first term. I'd have 4 times 3 times 2 times c4 plus 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times c5 by x minus a plus 6 by 5 by 4 by 3 by c6 by x minus a square, etc. And letting x equal a. This would imply that the fourth derivative at a is 4 times 3 times 2 times c4. Now the first derivative, right, going, going back to the top here, that was a 1 c0, right? f of a was 1 c0, and f prime of a was 1 c1. And then I have 2, and then 3 times 2, and then 4 times 3 times 2. And, you know, if you're paying attention, if you're following the pattern, f5 of a is going to end up being 5 times 4 times 3 times 2. And f6 at a is going to be 6 times 4 times, I'm sorry, 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2. And so now we really want to try to generalize here. So notice something. Let's look at those coefficients on the c0s. Let's look at those numbers multiplying the c0s. Isn't 1 equal to 0 factorial by definition? And 1 is 1 factorial, and 2 is 2 factorial, and 3 times 2 times 1 is 3 factorial, and 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 is 4 factorial. 5 factorial, 6 factorial. Do we see a pattern? And so in general, all right, let's generalize this. In general, the nth derivative at a is going to be n factorial, and I on the previous one, sorry, I, I forgot the c5 and the c6. Sorry about that. The nth derivative right, of f at a is going to be n factorial times c sub n, which implies that those coefficients, the c sub n, are the nth derivative at a divided by n factorial. This is useful information. We started by saying, assume that there's a power, rep a power series representation for a function. And then we wanted to find the coefficients. And it turned out that there was a pattern to those coefficients. So now, here's a conclusion. If a function has a power series representation at a, so that is, if we can represent the function as sigma n equals 0 to infinity of c sub n by x minus a to the nth power, where x my absolute x minus a is less than some r, then its coefficients are given by the formula c sub n is f uh, is the nth derivative at a over n factorial. And so we get this expansion. f of x is f of a plus f prime of a over 1 factorial times x minus a plus f uh, double prime a over 2 factorial by x minus a square plus f triple prime of a over 3 factorial by x minus a to the third plus etc. And this is called a this is called the Taylor series of the function f at a. That's a Taylor series. It's a power series representation of a function where these coefficients can be found with a special pattern. A special case exists. If we take the Taylor series and let x e and let a equal zero, then the function becomes sigma n equals zero to infinity f n of zero over n factorial times x to the n. Right? It's not x minus a to the n anymore. It's just x to the n because a is zero. And so therefore f of x is f of zero 
plus f prime of 0 over 1 factorial times x plus f double prime 0 over 2 factorial x squared plus f triple prime of 0 over 3 factorial x cubed, etc. This is called the Maclaurin series representation of the function. So now we're going to build some of these. We're going to take some functions. We're going to find the series representations of these functions. Determine the Maclaurin series for e to the x and find the associated radius of convergence. All right, so to do this, we're going to do a little side work first. We're going to look at the derivatives. Now, this is a Maclaurin series, so that means about x equals 0. All right, so if f of x is e to the x, then f prime of x is e to the x, and f double prime of x is e to the x. And, right, in fact, the nth derivative, right, the nth derivative of x of e to the x is e to the x. And so then f of 0 is e to the 0, which is 1 f prime of 0 is e to the 0, which is 1. f double prime of 0 is 1. And in fact, the nth derivative at 0 is 1. So if we consider the Maclaurin series that was presented on the previous slide, this implies then that e to the x would be 1 plus, because that's f of 0, plus f prime of 0, 1 over 1 factorial x to the first, plus 1, that's f double prime of 0, over 2 factorial x to the second, and 1 over 3 factorial x to the third, etc. So then e to the x can be represented as sigma n equals 0 to infinity of x to the n over n factorial. So there's the Maclaurin series representation for e to the x. Let's find the associated radius of convergence. I see that x to the n over n factorial. I'm going to use the ratio test. limit n approaching infinity absolute x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial over x to the n over n factorial go through a little bit of algebra here limit n approaching infinity let's see I'd have absolute x to the n plus 1 times n factorial over x to the n times n plus 1 factorial this simplifies uh, and limit x as n approaches infinity. Let's see, I'd have one extra factor of x in the numerator, and I'd have an n plus 1 in the denominator. So I can write that as absolute x times the limit with n approaching infinity of 1 over x to the uh, of 1 over n plus 1. And so that would, that would mean absolute x times 0. As n approaches infinity, 1 over n plus 1 is going to go to 0. So this is 0, which is less than 1 for all x. So this converges for all x. And so then its radius of convergence, therefore, is infinite. So now, what does this mean? We've got this series representation, and it's supposed to converge for all x. What does that really mean? Let's look at a graph. I'm going to bring up a graphing tool, and I've sort of set it up already. I want you to see what happens. So here's this graph. And I, I have on the graph the function f of x equals e to the x. 
and I have some other functions that I'm going to draw which are the partial sums of that series representation. So if I just took the first term, that's f of x equals 1. Now, notice this only converges. This, is only, this only looks close to the function at x equals 0. All right, now let me take the first two terms, 1 plus x. So that's a little bit better. That seems to be approaching the function on, a, on an interval near x equals 0. All right, let me remove that one. Let's increase it. So this is now the first three terms of the series. And notice how it's a better approximation. The first four terms of the series. The first five terms of the series. the first six terms of the series, the first seven terms of the series. The idea is, as n approaches infinity, this approximation, this series, gets closer and closer and closer to the actual function. And at infinity, it is exactly equal to this function. And in fact, this series converges for all x, but only as n approaches infinity. Let's see another example. Determine the Maclaurin series for cosine x and find the associated radius of convergence. Maybe you want to try this one out on your own, so now would be a good time to pause. All right, so like I did with the first, the previous exercise, I'm first going to look at some derivatives. Again, it's a Maclaurin series, so this means about x equals zero. All right, so my original function was cosine x, and so then f of 0 is 1. My first derivative is negative sine x. And f prime at 0 is 0. My second derivative is negative cosine x. So then at 0 is negative 1. My third derivative of x uh, is cos is positive sine x, and so then the third derivative at zero would be zero, and then the fourth derivative is back to cosine x, and so back to one. So notice what's going to happen here. Right, those f. Those, uh, those derivatives cycle 1, 0, negative 1, 0, 1, 0, negative 1, 0. So then cosine x would be equal to, using the Maclaurin series that was written a couple of slides ago, cosine x would be 1 plus 0 over 1 factorial x to the first plus negative 1 over 2 factorial x to the second, plus 0 over 3 factorial x cubed, plus 1 over 4 factorial x to the fourth, plus 0 over 5 factorial x to the fifth. I'm going to write this one more term, uh, plus negative 1 over 6 factorial x to the sixth, etc. Simplifying this a little bit, cosine x would then be equal to 1 minus 1 over 2 factorial x squared plus 1 over 4 factorial x to the fourth minus 1 over 6 factorial x to the sixth plus 1 over 8 factorial x to the eighth, etc. Well, let's put that in sigma notation. Cosine x would be sigma, let's start it at n equals 0, to infinity. 
Now let's see what we have. Notice that we have all evens on the powers, on the factorials and the powers. So we're probably going to involve a 2n somewhere. All right, it starts with a positive and then alternates. So I'll, let's see, I'll write this as negative 1 to the n. That gets me the correct sign. I would have an x to the 2n. Let's check that. The first term is at n equals 0, and I need an x to the 0. That works. The second term would be would, would occur when n equals 1, and that would give me 2 times 1. That works. Okay. And in the denominator, I would have a 2n factorial. There's cosine x. There's the series representation. All right, so applying the ratio test, we'd have the limit with n approaching infinity, absolute, negative 1 to the n plus 1, x to the 2 quantity n plus 1, over quantity 2, quantity n plus 1, close quantities, factorial, over negative 1 to the n, x to the 2n, over 2n, factorial. The negative 1 to the powers are going to go away under the absolute, so we'll get rid of them. And simplifying a little bit, we have the limit with n approaching infinity. I would have absolute, let's see, we'd have x to the 2n plus 2 in the numerator. I'd have an x to the 2n in the denominator. I'd have a 2n factorial in the numerator, and I would have a 2n plus 2 factorial in the denominator, and close the absolute value. All right, working with, uh, let's simplify this a little further. So I'd have the limit with n approaching infinity. I would have an absolute, let's see, x to the 2n plus 2 over x to the 2n. That would leave an x to the second in the numerator. And in the denominator, using uh, factorial, using what we understand about factorial, 2n plus 2 factorial would be equal to 2n factorial times 2n plus 1 times 2n plus 2. And so the 2n factorials re uh, are removed and we'd be left with a 2n plus 1 by 2n plus 2 in the denominator. All right, notice now that as n approaches infinity and if x holds steady that we'd have uh, an infinity in the denominator and some real number in the numerator. And so then this limit approaches 0 uh, for all x. And so since it approaches 0 for all x, that tells us that the radius of convergence uh, for the cosine, for the series representation of cosine x, is infinity. All right, so there's the series representation, Maclaurin series representation for cosine x and its associated radius of convergence. Again, I'd like to show you what this looks like graphically, what the series representation looks like. So here again is the graphing program, and I've set it up. Notice I have already the cosine graphed. And so here is the first term of the series, the first partial sum. And notice it, it only converges at a few certain points uh, near x equals 0, and then it, you know, coincidentally later on. All right, let's look at the second. So here's the first two terms, and notice how it's converging near x equals 0. Here's the first three terms. The first four terms. The first five terms. the first six terms. And again, if we were to allow more and more terms, this, this polynomial would better fit the cosine function further and further out from zero. 
and eventually as n approached infinity it would be exactly the same. Alright, here's another example. Determine the Maclaurin series for sine x and the associated radius of convergence. Now would be a good time to pause if you'd like to try this one out. Now, I could approach this the same way I did the previous exercise, by finding the, the derivatives uh, and writing the series out and then kind of collecting it into sigma notation. But here's what I'm going to notice instead. I'm going to notice that sine x is the integral of cosine x dx. And so that would be the integral of sigma n equals 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the n x to the 2n over 2n factorial dx. All right, integrating this, well, the negative 1 and the 2n factorial, those aren't affected by x, so I'll get a sigma n equals 0 to infinity, negative 1 to the n, I still have the 2n factorial x to the 2n, the antiderivative would be x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1. And I'd get a constant from the integration. Notice how now this 2n factorial times 2n plus 1, I can write that as 2n plus 1 factorial. So I get sigma n equals 0 to infinity, negative 1 to the n, x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial, plus a constant. Now, if we let, we got to figure out what that constant is. So if I let, what, what is the constant? I'll let x equal 0. If I let e x equal 0, notice that wipes out all of the terms under the sigma, and I would get sine of 0 equals c, and the sine of 0 is 0, so c is 0. And so therefore, sine x is equal to sigma n equals 0 to infinity, negative 1 to the n, x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial. The radius of convergence for sine x is the same as the radius of convergence for cosine x, since we used you know, the integral there and so the radius is infinite. You would get the same exact result if you started with you know, finding the derivatives and substituting x equals 0 and going from there. Determine the Maclaurin series for natural log of 1 plus x and find the associated radius of convergence. This would be another good time for you to try this one out on your own, so now would be a good time to pause. All right, I'm going to go with the more standard method here. All right, so if my function is the natural log of 1 plus x, all right, evaluating at 0, since we're looking at a Maclaurin series, f of 0 would be the natural log of 1, which is 0. All right, the first derivative would be 1 over 1 plus x. I'm going to write that as 1 plus x to the negative first power. And so then the first derivative at 0 would be 1 to the negative first, which is 1. The second derivative of x would be negative 1 by x plus 1 to the negative second, or 1 plus x to the negative second. All right, then f prime of, f double prime of 0 would be negative 1. The third derivative of x would be 2 by 1 plus x to the negative third. And so then f triple prime of 0 would be positive 2. The fourth derivative would be negative 6 by 1 plus x to the negative fourth. So the fourth derivative at 0 would be negative 6. All right, and so I hope you can sort of see a pattern forming here. Let's see, we would then have 24 
by 1 plus x to the negative fifth. And so the fifth derivative is at 0 is 24. And the sixth derivative at 0 uh, would be 24 times 5, 100, negative 120. So there's a pattern forming here. Notice that it's that factorial pattern again. This 1, that's a 0 factorial. That's a negative 1 factorial. That's a 2 factorial. That's an opposite of 3 factorial. That's a 4 factorial. That's a negative and a 5 factorial. So there's definitely a pattern forming here. All right, let's find the Maclaurin series. Then the natural log of 1 plus x would end up being f of 0, that's 0, plus 1 over 1 factorial x1, x to the first, minus, or I'll use plus, being consistent, plus negative 1 over 2 factorial x squared plus 2 over 3 factorial um, x cubed minus, or, or, no, I'm sorry, plus negative 6. Now I'm going to write that as negative, or the opposite of 3 factorial over 4 factorial x to the fourth. The next term is going to be a 4 factorial over 5 factorial x to the fifth. The next term is going to be plus a negative 5 factorial over 6 factorial x to the 6th, etc. So notice what happens here. The natural log of 1 plus x, what happens here? We get an x to the first, so that's an x. Then I get a minus 1 half x squared. Now let's look at the next term. I've got that 2 over 3 factorial. Well, the 3 factorial is 1 times 2 times 3. So the 1's are okay, the 2's go away, so I'm, I'm left with 1 third x cubed. Similarly, the next term is minus 1 fourth x to the fourth, plus 1 fifth x to the fifth, etc. So, natural log of 1 plus x, I can write that as sigma, and I'm going to go ahead and start it at uh, n equals 1. In this case, I'm going to start it at n equals 1. So that way I have an x to the n. I have an x to the n over n. And I just have to now adjust for the signs. Uh, so let's see, I'll have negative 1 to the n minus 1. So I've got negative 1 to the n minus 1 times x to the n over n. So there is the Maclaurin series representation. Let's find its radius of convergence, uh, applying the, uh, again, the ratio test. I would have the limit with n approaching infinity of absolute. Uh, let's see, I'd end up with, uh, uh, the negative one goes away. I'm not going to worry about the negative ones. So I've got x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 over x to the n over n. So that becomes the limit with n approaching infinity. I'd have, I'd end up after simplifying, I'd have x times n over n plus 1 under absolute. And so that's absolute x limit n approaching infinity of n over n plus 1. As n approaches infinity, n over n plus 1 will go to z, will go to 1. Right? This, that goes to 1. And remember, for the ratio test to show convergence, we would then need absolute x to be less than 1. So therefore, the radius of convergence for this series is 1. All right, we've done a lot of Maclaurin series. How about a Taylor series? So here we want a Taylor series for f of x equals 1 over x centered at a equals 3. Notice, for this function, we cannot find a Maclaurin series.
consider the function, right? 1 over x, it's, uh, it's undefined at x equals 0. And in fact, all of its derivatives are undefined at x equals 0. So we couldn't find a Maclaurin series for 1 over x, but we can find a Taylor series if we specify where it's centered. Since it's centered at a equals 3, we'll keep that in mind. All right, so let's go with our standard f of x is, I'm going to write that as x to the negative first. All right, so then f of 3 is 1 third. All right, the first derivative is negative x to the negative second. So f prime of 3 would be ne negative, and I'm going to write that as 1 over 3 squared f double prime of x would be 2x to the negative third. f double prime of 3 would be 2 times 1 over 3 cubed. Similarly, negative 6x to the negative fourth. And so then I would have, what, negative 6 times 1 over 3 to the fourth. Gosh, we've seen this pattern before, haven't we? f4 of x, 24 x to the negative fifth, so that would be 24 times 1 over 3 to the fifth, and again notice that pattern, right? If we put a 1 in, if we put a 1 and a 1 here, notice again we have that um, factorial pattern, 1, 1, 2, 6, 24, and it would continue on. All right, so So let's write out some terms of the series. All right, so the Taylor series for f of x is 1 over x. 1 over x is equal to f of 3. That would be 1 third plus f prime of 3. So that would be negative 1 times 1 over 3 square over 1 factorial by x minus 3. The next term would be 2 times 1 over 3 cubed over 2 factorial by x minus 3 square. The next term would be negative 6 by 1 over 3 to the fourth over 3 factorial by x minus 3 cubed. Let's write one more term here. 24 by 1 over 3 to the fifth over 4 factorial by x minus 3 to the fourth, etc. Now again, those factorials simplify a little bit, and we can bring the 1, one over 3 to the power down. So I can write this as 1 over x is equal to 1 third Let's see, my second term uh, would be minus, uh, x minus 3 over 3 s squared. The next term would be plus, the 2 over 2 factorial goes away, I end up with an x minus 3 square over 3 to the third. minus 6 is equal to 3 factorial. So minus x minus 3 cubed over 3 to the fourth. Similarly, the next term would be plus x minus 3 to the fourth over 4 factorial, etc. So 1 over x is equal to sigma n equals 0 to infinity. Now let's see. I've got a negative, I've got an alternating sequence, so I need a negative 1 to a power here, negative 1 to the n. I have an x minus 3 to the nth power in the numerator, and I've got a 3 to the n plus first power in the denominator. So there's the Taylor series, centered at a equals 3. Let's determine the associated radius of convergence. Again, I'm going to apply the um, ratio test. 
So then I'd have the limit with n approaching infinity. Again, the negative 1 to the power isn't going to matter here. I'll have an x minus 3 to the n plus 1 over 3 to the n plus 2 over x minus 3 to the n over 3 to the n plus 1. After some simplification, this would give me the limit with n approaching infinity. Uh, let's see, I'd have an x minus 3 remaining in the numerator, and I'd have a factor of 3 in the denominator. And notice that that does not involve the n at all. And so we just need this, so then this becomes absolute x minus 3 over 3, which we need to be less than 1. So that implies that absolute value of x minus 3 is less than 3. So therefore, there's the radius of convergence. Right? So the radius of convergence is 3. If you wanted to know the interval of convergence, the interval of convergence would be, now remember we're centered at 3 and our radius is 3, so the interval of convergence would be from 0 to 6. And we should, we would have to check the endpoint 6 to see if it converge. We know it won't converge when x equals uh, 0 because the function's undefined at x equals 0. So we really should check at x equals 6 to see if it converges there. Determine the Maclaurin series for cosine of pi x over 2. Well, we don't have to start from scratch. We know, I see this as a transformation. I know from before, I know that cosine x is equal to sigma n equals 0 to infinity negative 1 to the n x to the 2n over 2n factorial. The only difference is instead of x, right, replace x with pi x over 2. So then cosine of pi x over 2 would be sigma 0 to infinity, negative 1 to the n, pi x over 2 to the 2n over 2n factorial. That's good enough for me. That shows me you understand how to use it. Now this might not, if you know, if this was on the uh, in the textbook, they might not accept it. This not, might not be the answer shown in the textbook because it could be simplified Right? We don't like fractions in the numerator of a fraction, but this is good enough for me. Determine the Maclaurin series for f of x is x squared times the natural log of 1 plus x cubed. Right? So this might be a good one to try out on your own. So now would be a good time to pause. All right, so if we want the Maclaurin series for f of x is x squared times the natural log of 1 plus x cubed, the first thing I would notice is that this is x squared times, well, I, I know that, what do I know? I know that the natural log of 1 plus x is sigma n equals 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the n minus 1 by x to the n over n. Right, because we developed that earlier in this section. So I see that I have an x cube instead of an x. All right, I can deal with that. So then the function would be equal to x squared times sigma n equals 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the n minus 1 by x by x cubed to the n over n. So that's x squared sigma 0 to infinity negative 1 to the n minus 1 x to the 3n over n. Now I'm going to bring that x squared inside the sigma. 
So sigma 0 to infinity negative 1 to the n minus 1 by x to the 3n plus 2 over n. And so there's a Maclaurin series representation for the function. So here are some important Maclaurin series representations of functions. Um, some of them we've developed and a couple of them we haven't. Um, but you are expected to recognize, you're expected to know these series. You'll be expected to know them for the test. They will not be provided. All right, so you should know these series. I won't expect you to know uh, the, the binomial expansion as a series, um, but the other ones I, I will expect. And we've developed all of them except for uh, tangent inverse. So now let's see some examples of how we can use these series. This first example is, is an important identity uh, that you will use in a differential equations course. And if you ever do any complex analysis, you will certainly see this again. So if I, it represents the square root of negative 1, show that e to the i x is equivalent to cosine x plus i sine x. All right, well, let's start with what we know. We know that e to the x is the same as sigma, 0 to infinity, of x to the n over n factorial. So then e to the i x would be sigma, 0 to infinity, of i x to the n over n factorial. So let's expand that. e to the i x would be equal to i x to the 0 over 0 factorial plus i x to the first over 1 factorial plus i x to the second over 2 factorial plus i x to the third over 3 factorial etc. I'm going to list just a couple more terms here. Now, let's look at this. Let's remember a little bit of algebra. We assume that i to the 0 is 1. Right? We'll, 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 we'll accept that. We'll accept that i to the 0 power is 1. And i to the first power is i. Well, i square is negative 1 and i to the third is negative i, and then i to the fourth starts the cycle back over. So let's keep that in mind. All right, so e to the i x, first term, i x to the 0 over 0 factorial, that's going to be 1, or 1 over 0 factorial. The next term, i x to the first over 1 factorial, that's going to be i x over 1 factorial. The next term has an i square and an x square. So i square is negative 1, that's going to be minus x square over 2 factorial. The next term, i cubed, is negative i. So this is going to end up being a minus i x cubed over 3 factorial. And then the i start, cycle starts over. So then we'd have a plus x to the fourth over 4 factorial, a um, plus i x to the fifth over 5 factorial, and then a minus x to the sixth over 6 factorial, and a minus i x to the seventh over 7 factorial. Now, I'm going to rearrange and regroup this. 
I'm going to take everything without an I. I'm going to take everything that's real and group it together. So all the real terms. I'd have a 1 over 0 factorial, a minus x squared over 2 factorial, a plus x to the 4th over 4 factorial. My next, uh, let's see, then a minus x to the 6th over 6 factorial, etc. Notice that that's all the even powers. All right, what's left over? I have an i x over 1 factorial, a minus i x cube over 3 factorial, a plus i x to the 5th over 5 factorial, a minus i x to the 7th over 7 factorial. Now, notice all of those terms, uh, all of those terms to the right have a factor of i. All right, so I've got this whole thing here still. I'm not changing it, but I'm going to write this as i times x over 1 factorial minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the 5th over 5 factorial minus x to the 7th over 7 factorial, etc. Now, this first grouping, we should recognize that. We developed that earlier. That's cosine x. That's the Maclaurin series for cosine x. And even though we didn't develop it, we worked with it. That second grouping is the sine of x. And so we've just shown that e to the ix is equal to cosine x plus i sine x. And very closely related, a fairly famous statement says that e to the i pi plus 1 is 0. And we can actually show this to be true uh, using uh, letting x equal pi. All right, so that's very closely related and a fairly famous statement. And it is, in fact, true. Find the sum of the series, sigma n equals 0 to infinity, negative 1 to the n, pi to the 2n, over 6 to the 2n, 2n factorial. Ooh. Well, okay, here's what we don't want to do. We do not want to start writing out terms and see what happens. We make an assumption here that we're supposed to be able to find the sum, that it, it's going to fit something nice. And here's what I see. I see that 2n factorial. And right away, if when I see that 2n factorial, I'm thinking this is somehow related to cosine. I'm thinking that's related to cosine x. So remember that cosine x was sigma 0 to infinity of uh, negative 1 to the n, uh, x to the 2n over 2n factorial. So let's see, can I make it look like this? Well, look, I've got this pi to the 2n and this 6 to the 2n. So that means I should be able to write this as sigma, 0 to infinity, negative 1 to the n. And I've got the 2n factorial in the denominator. And that means I can write in the numerator, I've got a pi over 6 to the 2n. So notice that that's cosine x, where x is pi over 6. So this is then equal to the cosine of pi over 6, which, you know, from trigonometry, that's root 3 over 2. So that whole series sums to root 3 over 2. Find the sum of the series. Now this would be a good one for you to try on your own. So now would be a good time to pause. All right, so sigma 0 to infinity of 3 to the n over 5 to the n, n factorial. I can write that as sigma 0 to infinity of 3 fifths to the n over n factorial. And gosh, that looks pretty close to x to the n over n factorial. And x to the n over n factorial, well, that's e to the x. So then this is e to the 3 fifths. And that's it, e to the 3 fifths. All right, 
one more. We're asked to find the sum of the series 1 over 1 times 2 minus 1 over 3 times 2 cubed plus 1 over 5 times 2 to the 5th and 7 times 2 to the 7th. Hmm. Well, that, that first 2, that's a 2 to the 1st, isn't it? So I see a pattern here. Um, and it's alternating. Let me see if I can write this as a summation. Uh, let's assume it starts at 0 and goes to infinity. Now let's see. Uh, it starts with a positive, so I've got a negative 1 to the n. I have 1, 3, 5, 7. If we're starting at 0, that's a 2n plus 1. 2n plus 1. And then I've got 2 to that same power, so times 2 to the 2n plus 1. Now, 2n plus 1. Does that strike me as something familiar? I, I don't remember seeing that one. Let's go back to that, uh, that slide with all the important uh, series. Hmm. One of them has a 2n plus 1, right? Tangent inverse. Tangent inverse. So if I can write this as negative 1 to the n, x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1. Gosh, I'm pretty close to that. So let's see. I've got the 2n plus 1 in the denominator, but I need x to the 2n plus 1. So and I need it sort of in the numerator. All right, so here's what I'll do. Sigma, 0 to infinity, negative 1 to the n. I can write that as 1 half to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1. And so now this is equal to tangent inverse of 1 half, which is not, you know, that's not a special angle, so I'll just leave it there, tangent inverse of 1 half. All right, that concludes this presentation.